Okay. Pull out my notes. Um, it's going to be a series of three videos. Um, it's going to be called the Tarot Debunked. That's a question mark. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the tarot is basically a set of cards. Um, different people use them for different things. Uh, I have a deck here um, that I purchased I think a couple months ago, maybe three months ago. So uh, they're basic cards, right? Um, and they all have different designs on them. For example, this one is called um, the Emperor. Okay. Basically, um, each card is a uh, represents an archetype, or is an archetype, um, some a symbol that is universally um, accepted, generally understood throughout the world. Um, so, for example, this card, the Nine of Swords, um, the image is going to portray sadness, um, anxiety, loss, and most people um, that have uh, developed um, to have an understanding of symbols will interpret this card in that manner. There will be different variations, of course, that um, are different from one another. However, generally, the core concept is going to be the same. Um, so, let's see here. Okay. My understanding of the tarot is um, you can shuffle this deck, so it's in an order unknown to you, and um, create a what is called a spread. You can create positions for each of the cards. You can have a three card spread, for example. Okay. So you will shuffle the cards and you will lie them into different positions. One, two, and then three. Okay. Then each one of those cards will represent, um, or each one of those positions will represent something. For example, past of your life, present of your life, future of your life. And then you flip them over to reveal, uh, you know, the archetype. So you can place the archetype in the position and then view your life in that way through that lens. Um, so you can create different spreads, um, complicated ones, ones that use almost all of these cards that represent different areas in your life or represent something, okay? And then uh, it's, it's unique because it, it, it becomes um, a psychological tool. So normally people go through their day-to-day -day lives. They are trapped, in a sense, in their own perspective from day to day. And so what this allows the user to do is to get out of that perspective. Assume just for the moment that the symbol, the archetype, in that specific slot labeled how others see you. Assume that that's true because you're going to be guessing how others see you um, from your point of view, right? And that's not necessarily accurate. Neither is this, right? From my understanding, neither is this. However, at least this allows you to get out of your perspective and be like, what if? Ask that question, what if, okay? That's my understanding of tarot cards as a psychological tool to explore yourself and others without the confines of your usual day-to-day -day perspective. Now, others um, perceive the tarot as a form of divination. Um, there are different theories out there. Um, let me actually pull up one of them, if you can bear with me for a moment. Um, I have a quote in my Gmail box that I think, if I remember correctly, is uh, worthy for um, study or worthy at least to bring up at this moment. So it's loading my email box. Oh, I'm going to go to my drafts and then I have this excerpt from the book called The Sacred Tarot by C.C. C. Zane. The tarot cards utilize both extrasensory perception and extra physical powers. A vast amount of experimentation by universities in America and in England since the discovery of Pluto in 1930 not only proves that man possesses the power to gain through extrasensory perception information not accessible to reason and the physical senses, but that this perception extends into both the past and the future. Um, there is a long-winded um, 
ordeal here. But I think the general idea, that's actually not what I want to read you, the general idea is that um, your subconscious, most scientists agree these days that the human mind is divided into two parts. Um, that which you are conscious of and that which you are not conscious of, the conscious and the subconscious or the unconscious. And so the idea is, is that memory is stored in the subconscious. All of your experiences, all of your emotions, um, all of your perceptions, they're all stored within your subconscious mind. So when you're consciously navigating through your life, you can recall. Um, now, the ability to recall um, memories in your subconscious mind isn't always perhaps as good as you would want it to be. There is a theory, however, that you can contact your subconscious mind and allow it to uh, allow you to put it to use. And, and these cards, some believe, represent that. So um, the deal is you ask a question, you write it down, you speak it aloud. Um, and then you are going to use this to tap into your subconscious mind, and your subconscious mind will then give you an answer. Because um, the way you shuffle the cards, right, you don't shuffle them co consciously. You kind of relax, enter into um, a passive state of mind. Um, perhaps, uh, um, I don't remember if it's CC saying, but some, somebody uh, suggested that when you cut the deck, you cut it with your left hand because that allows the least amount of conscious control. And then through synchronicity, um, then the cards are laid out in a certain order that is supposed to represent some sort of knowledge higher than your own conscious knowledge at that moment. I hope that's a good description. Um, it's something that I think is plausible. It's not necessarily something I believe as truth, but I think it's plausible. Now there's this book that I've been reading called The Intention Experiment. Um, this uh, is centered around mostly experiments uh, through, let me see here, the Princeton. Um, it's called The Pair. Oh, okay, I doesn't say it here. Basically, it's centered around some experiments at Princeton, MIT, um, that have to do with uh, how your thoughts or your intentions, how observer effect can actually warp information, warp data, um, kind of control how you perceive things. Um, one of the experiments noted in here is, uh, I think it was at Princeton, where um, this scientific team devised this experiment where a computer um, would randomly display one of two images, one of a cowboy and one of an Indian. And... Uh, they developed a program that would be the equivalent of flipping a coin. So when they ran this program, about roughly 50% of the time, the image of the Indian would show up, and roughly 50% of the time, the image of the cowboy would show up. However, when they placed subjects in the room and asked them, asked them, look, focus on the Indian. Focus on the Indian. Think about the Indian. Breathe deeply. Just kind of focus on the Indian. The image of the Indian would jump 20%. So 70% of the time, the uh, randomly generated image would bring up that of an Indian, and then the other 30% would bring up the image of the cowboy. Now this is, uh, see, even reading that for me is very difficult to believe. It's so, the implications of that are just so, astonishing to me. How much time do I have? Nine minutes. So astonishing to me. So what I've decided to do is to devise an experiment similar with the tarot. Maybe this will be one of four videos. I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, this will be one of four videos. Um, I'm going to devise an experiment with the tarot to do something similar. And I'm going to talk about that in the next video. So um, that's it for now. Hopefully this is of interest to you. This is what I've been studying, getting into recently. Um, I I've been contemplating the extreme, the Richard Dawkins, the scientist, the materialist, versus Deepak Chopra, the um, spiritualist. Um, Look up those figures if you haven't haven't already. Um, they represent two extremes of of kind of an ongoing debate 
about how to view the world, how to view reality. All right, I think I'm done.